sorry. Um, just before we start, can I just ask everybody to put their mobile phones on silent, please? Thank you. Right, we'll start. I have an hour, but I don't intend to keep you for an hour. I'm very impressed that the likes of Ken Murray will come all the way from Bilton County Cork on a Saturday morning to hear me speak, or William Aylmer, who's himself an experienced uh, mediator and who got out to deliver everything that I'm going to say. But I'm conscious, uh, as someone who believes in attending seminars as an attendee, that usually you come away from a seminar with one of two reactions. There's a nugget of information you get and you say, no, that will come in handy sometime. And the other one is, oh, my sweet Jesus, there's a file I must check when I get back to the office. Uh, I don't know if I've got any of the, the latter category today, but hopefully some of what I say will uh, come in useful. Um, sorry about the, the white screen. There was a bit of a technological issue. I did up the slides using a certain backdrop uh, earlier in the week, and uh, the, some elements were, were removed in translation before it got to, to the screen here. So you're going to get hit with the bright lights of, of a white background through most of this this morning. Um, me, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a repentant lawyer, is how I describe myself these days. Uh, they're all the, the qualifications. I've put in red the bit uh, about a company director. I'm a company director of 19 different companies. And I want to speak to you from the point of view of somebody who, like a mediator, sees both sides of the fence, both as a practicing lawyer, but equally someone who sees it from the point of view of the business client in particular. And to explain to you why there's a business case for mediating rather than necessarily litigating. Uh, I'm hoping to convert Geraldine from the satanic church of litigation this morning, uh, but we'll see you at the, at the end of the day. I'm also ever so slightly involved in mediation. Uh, in particular, but ADR, including arbitration. Um, I'm the chair of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in Ireland uh, this year, hence that badge up there. Uh, any inquiries for membership afterwards, I'll happily talk to you. Uh, I'm a member of the Law Society ADR Committee. I'm newly appointed this year to the uh, Insurance Committee as well, and I'm a member of the Council of the Mediators Institute. So as you can see, I've an ever so slight interest in uh, alternative dispute resolution. And the way I describe it is that having worshipped in the satanic church of litigation along with Geraldine for about 20 years, I converted to the one true faith of mediation about 10 years ago. And hopefully I'll be able to convert some of you uh, to the cause as well. Um, in the context, when I talk about the, the, the business uh, background to this, the Chamber of Commerce, for example, have launched a mediation scheme, unfortunately not taken up to any great degree. Uh, this was launched about two or three years ago and was backed by all these constituent groupings that you can see here, the Law Society, the Chartered Institute, the Mediators Institute and the Bar Council. Uh, and the idea was to, through the Chambers of Commerce, to try and promote the concept of mediation. Because, for example, if you look at the Australian experience, the first port to call for business people who have a problem is that they will go to the local Chamber of Commerce to see can they help to sort it out. Um, in Ireland, the first port of call is usually the, the, the solicitor. So there's a, a different emphasis. It, there hasn't been any great take up on this. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have been nominated uh, by each of the constituent members with the exception of the Bar Council. They wouldn't have me for some good reason. Um, the business case. This is a quotation from a UK case where, I, by the way, I'm a great believer, particularly on a Saturday morning, uh, of using cartoons and slides. So if you want to just enjoy the cartoons and come back to the text as a cure for insomnia later, knock yourself out. But uh, the essential idea is you get the message. You can study this in detail if you want to at a later stage. But uh, on board Snip Nua, if you remember that a few years ago, uh, looked at various examples about mediation and why it should be used, particularly in the case of government bodies. And they cited the example of the Dublin Airport Authority and the air uh, regulator who went to war in very expensive high court proceedings where there were legal costs of over half a million involved to resolve an issue and they were highly critical of the expenditure of public money like that. Now none of us are going to object to our pension funds uh, if you have enough surplus money or just the day-to-day -day bills of, of paying the DSB, practicing certs insurance or whatever, um, you know, coming in the door to us as lawyers. But I'm going to explain to you why I think there's a case to be made for uh, making more money out of mediation than necessarily out of litigation. Um, again, the judicial endorsement for it, this is an English case, uh, the, the particular case involved a dispute over a motor car, where the value of the motor car was one tenth of the cost of the legal costs involved in the case, believe it or not. Um, but the judge commented that it brings an area of reality to the negotiations, and it's a, a perfectly acceptable uh, thing to do. Now, the thing about litigation is it's limited what a court can do in terms of its uh, outcome. It's limited as well in terms of what it can look at in assessing the merits or demerits of one side's case or the other. But sometimes you don't really find out what's going on underneath. 
And I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I mediated uh, a case involving a dispute between two brothers. Now, there was a 10-year age gap between these two brothers, very successful company, a multi-million uh, turnover per annum. And the younger brother uh, decided he wanted to cash in. And he put it to the older brother, we've reached the peak of this market, it's time to cash in, we can get a good offer, we should get out, uh, and I want to go to America and, and set up there in a different type of business. The older brother said, what are you talking about? We have another 20 years at least of growth in this business. Um, but I don't understand. Now, I was asked uh, through a Chambers of Commerce connection, not through the scheme, uh, to, to mediate. And uh, myself and a, a, another chap, not a lawyer, I guess he'd be known to, to William, a good chap by the name of Keith Kelleher, we mediated. And the two brothers arrived together, great form, very chatty, very chirpy, uh, and after an opening session went into the caucus sessions. And it became apparent very quickly to us that they enjoyed a very warm personal relationship, godfather to the other's children, etc., but when it came to business, they had no method of communication. They lobbed memos at each other for about three years. Uh, and it, this thing had escalated through memos, but they, they weren't actually communicating. And one of the things we tried to do was to get them to, to communicate and to talk. But in the course of the mediation, uh, you'll see a slide later about Humpty Dumpty, and I described the mediator at times as being like Humpty Dumpty sitting on the wall, who gets to see both sides of, of, of the wall, not just one side of the wall. But in the course of the mediation, part of the mediator's job is to try and build an empathy and a trust and get the parties to trust you. We established that with these two people. But the younger brother eventually confided. The reason he wanted to cash in had nothing to do with the business. But he couldn't actually tell his brother the real reason. And the real reason was he and his wife couldn't conceive. And at the age of 40, he figured a six-year assessment process would bring him to 46, and he'd be just at the outer edge of eligibility age-wise to adopt. Whereas if you went to the States, they're crying out for adoptive parents there. But he needed the nest egg to be able to invest. Now, when we got that liberty to share that with the older brother, the older brother said, that's not a problem at all. We can free up money. Uh, he doesn't have to be full-time involved. He can stay involved at a distance. And that's the solution they came to. And the brother continued involvement with the company, but from the States where he set up another business. Um, so it was a win-win for both sides. That was a number of years ago. They actually sold the company since for four times what it was worth three or four years ago when we mediated. So it worked out from all their points of view. Equally, you can have a litigation paralysis where once parties get locked into a very heavy contested litigation, it can paralyse a business. It can paralyse it in terms of funds or its business development plans. Um, or if somebody was locked in a dispute where there was a restraint of trade clause, for, for example, uh, you know, the litigation could be over. And I've had a couple of those cases in the franchise area where the, the one year post cessation uh, limitation or non-trading provision was actually up by the time the case came to be decided. Um, equally, the timetable that's involved. Uh, only last month, the beginning of October, I went to Galway to mediate between two professionals who had fallen out over a dispute. It was where somebody had bought out a practice and retained the former practice principal for a period of time. And then, as they were entitled to do under the agreement, terminated the arrangement. Uh, but there was a restraint to trade clause, um, an uncompete clause, prohibiting the former practice owner from continuing in practice in a geographical area for one year. Now, this came to me through the uh, CEO of the professional body who asked could I mediate. But between the row breaking out and us successfully mediating, it was a period of 17 days. Now, you'd hardly have an initiating letter and a reply out in litigation within that time period. And we managed to come to a compromise that suited both sides. It made sense. And that's the, the economic and, and business reality of it. Um, again, the same case, the judge said that it was completely cuckoo for these parties to have engaged in litigation. Couldn't understand why they had thrown so much money, over 100,000 in costs, uh, into a, a row about a, a car as it happened. Um, again, no, in, sorry, that should be down. Get out of that. Yeah. Wrong buttons. It's not a sign of weakness. Does it, some people think that you know, they shouldn't be the first to mediate uh, or have to offer to mediate on the basis, aha, we have them on the ropes if they're offering to mediate. They don't want to litigate for one reason or another. That's not it at all. It makes common sense. Blame me if you want to. Say I went last Saturday, last month, last year to a talk, and Bill Hoolahan says you should do it, therefore I'm going to do it. 
Nobody listened to that, but you could try it. Um, but it's, it's a perfectly sensible adjunct to mediation, as the judge said in that case. Again, uh, the mediator choice is important. It should be like horses for courses. If you're going to go on a competition law case, if you're going to choose a senior counsel, you'll get somebody who knows about competition law. You're not going to get somebody who's an expert in agricultural law if it's a competition law issue or whatever. Equally, when it comes to mediators, you need mediators who are horses for courses. And the most important skill a mediator can have is empathy. You don't need necessarily to have an expert in a particular area. Uh, so, for example, a number of years ago, uh, there was a dispute and it involved three insurance companies to deciding who was going to carry the can between them in relation to something. And the, I was suggesting mediation. I was acting for one of the insurance companies. And an in-house counsel or solicitor for one of the insurance companies on the other side said, um, oh, we'll have to get an expert senior counsel with an expertise in insurance law. And I said, no, this is Joe Punter versus three insured bodies. We need a good empathic mediator. We don't need an expert in insurance law. This isn't about insurance law. And when I explained the logic of it, they understood it. And we eventually ended up with a non-lawyer as the, the mediator. And uh, it eventually mediated successfully. So, again, you've got to you pick the, the right person. Um, the, we now have the Act. The Act hasn't been commenced yet, but it was signed by the President on the 2nd of October. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the legislative process, but once it's been passed by the Houses of, Oroc of the Oroctus, it is sent to the President, and the President must sign it within five days. Now, when I heard on the preceding Tuesday, that, or Thursday, that it had been sent to the President, I did something which apparently was unprecedented. You know the way Donald Trump has these big ceremonies where he signs things, usually orders banning Muslims, etc., and the pens are now prized objects of desire to be passed around to people when he signs these things. Big signing ceremony, big publicity PR thing. I contacted the office of the President and I said, look, historic moment in Ireland, can I witness the signing of the bill into law as an act? And I paraphrase, but the answer was, Jesus, no one's ever asked that question before. Apparently, no one has ever asked to witness. No one has been interested enough to ask, could they witness it? So the, the answer came back, apparently, from the, the president himself saying, sorry, uh, unprecedented request, not going to change practice now. We'll have a think about it for the future, but sorry, you're out of luck. But I got the second best prize. Uh, they promised me that as soon as it was, it was signed, I'd get a text. So at five past six on the 2nd of October, uh, outside of the RS. I'm led to believe, it may have been trying to flatter me, I got a text saying it had been passed and I was able to tweet that first. Ray, Claim to fame. Anyway, the Act. How is it laid out? This is the, a breakdown of the Act. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these in, in detail, but that's essentially the way the Act breaks down and what the Act actually deals with. Um, what it doesn't do, it doesn't actually define what it does deal with. It tells you what it doesn't deal with. So, by a process of elimination stroke inference, you can see what it does deal with. It doesn't actually stipulate any training or standard requirements. They can follow, again, through devolved legislation, so to speak, through the Mediation Council, and if they start bringing in codes of practice and, and if they start setting standards. But the Act itself doesn't set standards. It says if you have some, you must tell the people about it, but it doesn't actually say that you have to have any. And even then, as William could tell you at length, uh, you know, you can say, I have no standards, could be the standards to which you operate. It doesn't give any particular group a role. There's a lot of discussion over recent years as to whether somebody like the Mediation uh, or the Mediators Institute might become the, essentially the, the regulator. Um, but that's not provided for uh, anywhere. And even the Mediators Institute are a bit wary of becoming the regulator because they can no longer be the trade union, so to speak, if they become the regulator. It doesn't provide any funding towards... Uh, mediation. So there's a provision for a mediation council to oversee all of this type of thing, but there's no budgetary provision for it. And obviously, if you're going to set up a mediation council, you're going to have a meeting, and you're going to need the sandwiches, and you're going to need the tea and the coffee, and the hotel room to meet in, who's going to pay for that? No funding. So will it happen? We wait and see. Uh, these are some of the things that I intend to try and cover in the next half hour or so, uh, just going through all the, the various elements uh, of the process. Back to Humpty Dumpty sitting on the wall, right? And hopefully, like Humpty Dumpty, uh, you won't fall off and, and uh, break. But the advantage of the mediator, I've sometimes described it, is you get, you get to sit on the wall and you see into both camps. Back to the thing I talked about earlier, where John, the senior counsel, approached me uh, in the negotiations and said, you know, we won't take less than 200. Negotiations uh, in that kind of a scenario is a game of poker. It's a question of bluff. 
Because are they serious or are they not serious? You know, what, what, what's the real bottom line? And unless you know your colleague well and you can face to face, you know, laugh at them without them getting insulted uh, and say, come on, get real. We know what the real story is. Uh, you know, you could be playing poker in the same way that you turn up in Las Vegas and you have an unknown player on the other side. You don't know. The idea of the mediator is within the whole thing, which is confidential, any, within each if you remember back to your junior cert, as now called, I didn't it is the intercert, your maths, you have a set which encompasses the whole thing. That's the set of confidentiality. And within that, you have two smaller circles as well, which is uh, the zones of confidentiality surrounding each individual party, or parties, if you have uh, three or four. And anything you hear as a mediator within those subsets is confidential, and nothing gets passed back unless you get the permission of the parties to do it. But the advantage is you get to know exactly what James's bottom line is. And while James in the prior negotiations might have said he's willing to take uh, 500 to settle this, and that could be thousands or, or simply euros, and William on the other hand is, is saying, no, no, it's not worth more than 50. If James levels and says, look, you know, I'm, I'm actually prepared to accept not 500, I'll take 250. And the reason I'll take it is the following. God forbid, I've cancer, terminal, I'm dying, I want to have the, and the claim will die with me, I want to have it for the benefit of my family. Or, I can't actually afford to litigate this. Or, I'm emigrating, or whatever. But there's some reason why they're willing to compromise. And you understand it. You now know what their zone of settlement is. Equally, if William is candid with you, you can find out if they're within the zone of settlement. Now, sometimes... They won't inter those zones won't intersect, and you've got to try and move people forward uh, or backwards to, to see will they come to an accommodation. And that's part of the process of uh, the mediator. You've got to try and convince people that they thought of the good idea to, to move towards a settlement for some reason. Um, but that's the part of it. The definition under the Act, confidential, voluntary, with the assistance of a mediator to arrive at a mutually uh, acceptable agreement. So it's the party's agreement. It's entirely voluntary. You can't force them into it. There's no compulsion to go to mediation except in one instance that I'll mention later. Um, so the idea is that you give people the opportunity to, to engage. And an awful lot of it, uh, and I'd invite William to comment on this uh, as well, is that people need to be heard. And you're not, the you're not a judge, you're a mediator. But you hearing their story is one thing. Equally, they'd like to know that the other side have heard their story and understand their story. Not that they accept their story, not that they accept that they're right, but they understand where they're coming from. And that's a very important part of the process. Uh, it's not that you're there to validate what they're saying, but that it, it is accepted as to their bona fides or otherwise. Um, and that's a very important part of it from their uh, perspective. Um, moving on. What is a mediator? Now, it's not... Uh, a 57-year-old, formerly red-haired, now slightly balding, grey-haired, slightly overweight uh, male. It's male or female. It's an empathic person. Uh, the, the attributes, that's the definition of the act, is a person appointed under an agreement to mediate to assist the parties to resolve it. But what do you need? Hard head for insults, because you will get a few. Big ears to listen more. And remember, uh, whether you believe in a God or not, uh, is your own personal choice, but to use the expression, God gave two ears and one mouth to be used in that proportion. Um, big heart, because you've got to absorb it, and a lot of what people will try and uh, put on you, either impose on you, or they'll just dump on you, uh, in emotional terms. An ego container, because you will deal with some egos, and you need to be able to contain them, uh, and address the power imbalance at times between parties. Uh, big feet firmly on the ground, you, you need to be able to stand your ground, because sometimes people will try and put you under pressure. And a big bladder. Now, the reason for the big bladder or a colostomy bag is because, and again, you have to, as mediator, explain this to the parties. You will have these caucus sessions where you're shuttling between the rooms, trying to mediate between them. Um, and you have to explain to people, you know, you're actually doing double the amount of work in one sense that they're doing as a party while they're there, or their lawyers, if they're with them, are doing there. Because they have downtime. As a mediator, you're off working again. So every now and again, you have to say to them, look, I'm taking some me time. I need to go to the toilet, I need to have a sugar rush, or whatever it is. Uh, and that's all part of the managing the process. Um, what, what mediation is defined as? Confidential, 
I've already covered that. Voluntary, except in one case I'll mention later, with the assistance of a mediator to resolve the, the dispute. Um, again, this method of uh, resolution, locking people in until they, uh, their, their own bladders give out, that's not recommended. You don't put people under pressure. You try and make it as a, a comfortable environment so that somebody doesn't feel threatened. Part of the process in terms of court equally can be that, that people don't feel, aren't uh, in a threatening environment. I've given evidence, I think, about four times in the past 35 years in practice. And I can tell you, it's a completely different exercise to be giving evidence where you're being attacked. You know, the, the formality of proving something in court, some document or, or other, and you just go up and you're, you're sworn in, you say, job oxo, that's fine. But when you're being attacked as a witness in a box in relation to something, it's a very different experience. And we kind of take being in court for granted because we do it every day. Uh, maybe not if you're a conveyancer. But... Um, you know, it, for some people will find it not only intimidating, but absolutely terrifying. So you can have this safe, comfortable environment within a mediation where they don't have that uh, proximity or problem. Um, equally, you can add something to it. I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, uh, I had a client who was a librarian in an academic institution. And similar, it wasn't the Galway case now, uh, but the, the Shahi Skeffington case. It was a different librarian, different institution. But similar in terms of harassment, bullying, denial of uh, interview opportunities, denial of, op of promotion, discrimination on family grounds, religious grounds, etc. Great case. And I said, right, you know, from what you tell me, you have a great case. We can go to court. Now imagine the following scenario. Um, we're walking out of the courthouse and we're coming down the steps uh, and you've resonating in your ears a rounding con condemnation by the judge of the academic institution or all the line managers all the way up to the president for having allowed this situation to go on for years after years for having ignored all your pleas that something would be done and you've they've been ordered to pay you a whopping amount of money and they've been ordered to pay uh, legal costs which will make me very happy as well however you're looking across and coming down the other side of the steps are your immediate line manager his stroke her line manager all the way up to the president the people you're going to face the following morning when you go into work. How is that going to work for you? And she said, it won't. And I said, okay. Now, given the specialised nature of your job function, how many equivalent positions are there, even in Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales? And she said, less than 20. I said, right. So your job mobility is not like that of a forklift driver who can walk out in a huff and get a job somewhere else. You've got very limited mobility. So... What's the reality of beating the crap out of them in court and getting a huge award, humiliating them publicly and being able to go back to work? And she said, it couldn't happen. I said, fine. So we work on an alternative solution. And we mediated a solution, uh, which saved face all around. Um, there were a couple of interesting twists in it. Uh, one of the things was that uh, the person had been reprimanded. Uh, in the kind of Basically, libraries, they don't use sprinklers for fairly obvious reasons. It, kind of damages the stock if the sprinklers go off if you've got books and stuff so they use a thing called radon gas anyone familiar with radon gas no basically it suppresses the fire but it does it by knocking out the oxygen unfortunately it also knocks out all the human beings that are in the building when the radon goes off so the academic institution sent a team around the world at over 100 grand of cost to visit other libraries they obviously had an entire of email to find out how do you do it came back produced this report and said look not much alternative to the old radon gas jobs oxo circulated to every user of the library in an academic institution that meant every member of staff, every student, 10,000 people or whatever. The librarian had hit her reply all, and with a quote from Virgil in Latin, which translates as, the mountains groaned and gave birth to a mouse. In other words, is that all there is at the end of all of that process and all that expense? Somebody who had peripherally been involved in the uh, production of the report made a complaint under the harassment and bullying that they were the, being denigrated as the mouse. Uh, they had to go to the professor of classics, mind you, to have the phrase translated because they didn't know what it meant and they didn't use Google Translate. Harassment and bullying. The line manager, without talking to the person who had sent this comment by way of reply, put a letter of reprimand and censure on her file. So it was on her, per her personnel file. And it was only in the context of uh, our subsequent meeting to resolve this that the irony of the letter of reprimand dawned on the librarian who put it on the file because they said you should not make use of an archaic language that's latin in case you're wondering 
where the intensio octoris might be misunderstood. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what intensio octoris is, it means the intention of the author. And it was only as I read it out there and then that you could see people going, oh, God almighty. Um, hadn't dawned on them. Anyway, so that's an example of where you can uh, bring things out and, and resolve them. Um, the original wording of the bill actually referred to legal proceedings. It now refers to a dispute of any kind. So it applies to court disputes and non-court disputes, before, during, uh, even after. Um, if, it, if it had remained as civil proceedings, you'd have only had court refer, it, applying to court referred mediation. But as a result of mediations, or representations by various uh, parties and bodies, uh, it came out that they, they changed it to, to provide that it was for all disputes. Um, who doesn't the rules apply to? It doesn't apply to anything under the purview of the Workplace Relations Commission. It doesn't apply to anything involving the Revenue Commissioners, anything under the Arbitration Act, anything to do with domestic violence, family law, childcare, etc. Um, Section 6 sets out the general nature of what mediation is. It's a voluntary process, can be entered and exited at any, at any time, and the agreement to mediate must set out all of that, and the agreement to mediate must be in writing. The parties can be assisted by any person of their choice. It doesn't have to be a lawyer. It doesn't have to be anybody. They can come alone. They can come with a spouse. Uh, the two professional mediation in Galway in October that I mentioned, they, they were accompanied by their spouses, both of whom happen to be professionals as well, uh, but there, there were no lawyers involved. So in, in one sense, they did the lawyers out of their fee. In another sense, they saved that expense. Um, I got a phone call about a fortnight ago from an, an accountant who was going to recommend to somebody that they go to mediation. But he said, look, it's all about the numbers. There's no real law involved. Uh, do we have to have lawyers involved? And I said, no, you can come along to the mediation as uh, an advisor in, in your role as a, an accountant. Um, the agreement to mediate, it must be in writing. It must set down the manner in which the mediation is going to be conducted. Uh, the devil is in the detail if you want to skim through it. It sets down in which the manner in which the fees are to be paid. Now, there's a general principle that both sides would pay. Sometimes you'll get somebody saying, I'll go to mediation, but only if the other side pay. And as a mediator, I always explain, that's a bad idea. Because in the back of your mind, if you know that the other side are paying me to act as the mediator, and sometimes I'm doing a reality check with you, I'm asking you, are you being realistic? You might think, oh, he's only saying that because he's being paid by the other side. So the fundamental principle going in should be that each side bear it equally. It may be a mediated outcome that one side picks up the tab or all the costs that are involved, but that could be an outcome. It sets the time, the place, etc. that the mediation is going to be held. Uh, state that, it, that it's confidential and parties sign up to a confidentiality agreement. Now, not, today is not the day to get into a discussion about how enforceable confidentiality agreements are, but they, they are signing not quite in blood. Uh, equally, as a result of some experiences, uh, back to the, the good faith element, one of the things that I'm contemplating of doing is writing about uh, good faith mediation. And I've amended my standard agreement that I send out to people when I'm asked to act as mediator to include a much more expansive good faith mediation clause where people commit to the process in good faith. And the reason for that is that I was involved in one uh, mediation, for example, where the parties turned up and they turned up because there was a contractual obligation to mediate for a minimum of eight hours before going to litigation. But they didn't want to mediate. So literally they turned up, took off the watch, put it down, folded the arms and started to stare off. And in fairness to the mediator, uh, after three hours of trying to get them to engage, he shut it down and said, I'm shutting this down and it can be reported uh, that I, as the mediator, shut this down because there was no point. Now, he wasn't pointing the finger at one side or the other, but he was sending a message to the court. If somebody said, tried to say, oh, we went to mediation but it didn't work, uh, yes, judge, but it was in circumstances where the mediator, after three hours, shut it down because the mediator formed the view that it was going nowhere. Now, that sends a message. Somebody was playing silly buggers in terms of the process. It must state the right of the parties to seek legal advice. Uh, say in what circumstances it can be terminated and any other terms that are going to be agreed. Uh, the mediator's obligation, at the outset the mediator must establish that there's no conflict of interest. Um, now, in a media one mediation where I was asked to mediate be again between two professionals, I said, I don't think I can act as the mediator in this because it so happens that one of the parties is known to me. They were my next door neighbour 40 years ago. I haven't seen them in over 40 years, apart from one social encounter uh, two years ago, where they identified themselves to me because I didn't recognise them. Um, and we had a chat over a cup of tea. But I, in those circumstances, I don't think that I should be the mediator. And in fact, that so impressed the other side that it disclosed even that. They said, no, if, 
if you're that upfront, then I'm happy to have you as the mediator. Um, so I did mediate in, the, in that scenario, but you, you, you must establish your impartiality. And if anything crops up at any stage, which means that you might be perceived as not being impartial, in the same way as a judge or an arbitrator might have to accuse themselves, you have to do that as well. You must give details of your training, your qualifications, uh, the code to which you uh, subscribe, if any, uh, but there's no obligation to have any particular code or to have a code incorporate anything. You must act with impartiality and integrity. You may make proposals for resolution if the parties invite. In other words, you move beyond simple mediation and become a former conciliator with a view to seeing can you uh, suggest something to the parties. Sometimes the answer is obvious. You try and make the parties think of it themselves, but if it comes to it, they can uh, invite you to do it. And you make every reasonable effort to minimise costs. And part of that means that essentially when you're setting out your costs, you have to do it on a kind of a metered basis. Because if you bill in advance for a day and you do it in a half day, you're supposed to give, you have an obligation to give back uh, an element of the fee. Not necessarily half, but some of it. If you're withdrawing, you must give the reasons why you're withdrawing and you must return a proportion of the fees as appropriate. You can't make the fees contingent on the outcome. Now, I, I have had the situation where um, somebody said uh, that they were happy to have me mediate as long as I achieved a result. Uh, the unspoken bit obviously achieved the result that they wanted. And I said, no, that's not how it works. Um, you know, you get paid regardless of whether there's an outcome or not. The object of the exercise is to achieve an outcome. And uh, you know, obviously, as a mediator, you like your track record to reflect success. So you make every effort to try and ensure, but you can't do that necessarily. Uh, you've got to manage any conflicts of interest that arise uh, during the course of the thing. I've already mentioned about the fees being split equally. Um, you, the intermediate must set all that out. The codes of practice. Uh, this is under the... Uh, I've lost something here. Is right? Because the practice uh, can be set by the Mediation Council and they may deal with various issues. They don't have to deal with various issues, but they may do. CPD on an ongoing basis, uh, mediation procedures, uh, standards for accreditation, procedures to be followed during mediation, ethical standards for mediators, confidentiality obligations, redress, complaints, etc. Standard type of regulatory stuff. That can all be provided for by the Mediation Council uh, if and when we get a Mediation Council, if and when somebody provides funding for it. The confidentiality issue, again, a statutory uh, provision in relation to uh, mediation, saying that all communications, including oral statements, all records and notes related to mediation are confidential and not to be disclosed in any court proceedings whatsoever. So here's a statutory basis uh, when somebody says, uh, I want to bring you, Mr. or Miss Mediator, to the hearing of the court proceedings to explain how big a bastard stroke, whatever, uh, the other side were, you say, sorry, no can do. Uh, I have a statutory uh, cover of confidentiality. I can't be forced to disclose it. Now, there are exceptions in relation to the family law, dangers to, to persons, etc., but they're the exceptions rather than the, the rule. Um, so, the story with third parties. Uh, as a mediator in managing the process, you will find out who's going to be attending. And in your draft agreement, if Joe Bloggs is attending as a friend or whatever, you provide that they sign off the agreement. And there's a grand signing ceremony, not with Donald Trump style, but there's a signing ceremony at the start where everybody in the room should sign up to the agreement and the confidentiality obligations that are under it. Uh, important that you do that because if they don't, they might well argue that they're not bound by confidentiality and they go, can go off and talk about it. Is there a mediator privilege? Not as such. Uh, there is the protection of the confidentiality provision under Section 9, but there's no independent uh, mediator privilege concept in, in law generally. The enforceability of, and it's important by the way to, to uh, ensure that, that all that is documented. Um, I was in a mediation where I was representing a party where a very experienced mediator, for some reason, forgot to sign the agreement at the outset. And it was only during the caucus sessions uh, that the mediator realised they hadn't got it done and they, uh, as a result of being prompted that they had forgotten to do it and they uh, got it signed up at that stage. But it's important to have that uh, done at that stage. The enforceability, section 11, it's a matter for the parties to determine the enforceability of an agreement. In other words, they can provide that, it, that they arrive at an agreement, but whether or not it's to have the binding force of a contract, which a settlement agreement normally would have, that's a matter for them. Um, and again, there are family law exemptions because they, the courts under the Family Law Acts have certain obligations to ensure that there's adequate protection for people, uh, adequate provision, etc. Uh, then the Mediation Council, I've already covered that. What they're to do, the functions that set out in Schedule 1 of the Act, it's the promotion of public awareness, the development of standards, codes, uh, ethics, etc. Uh, to provide a register of uh, mediators. Um, practicing solicitors, and this is the 
the important bit. Uh, as solicitors, we have an obligation to advise the clients in relation to attempting to resolve during dispute and the advantages of doing it. In other words, it's not, you know, mediation is a good idea. I think you should think about it. You actually have to provide them with information and documentation, explaining the process, explaining the advantages, explaining why they should consider doing it. Now, the difficulty is that a lot of uh, lawyers haven't been trained in relation to this and they're playing catch up in relation to it. Even in, in the law school at the moment in Blackhall Place, where William and myself would uh, lecture on a regular basis, it's an optional extra. It's not part of the core curriculum. So not everybody is signing up to this. And very often I find when I'm approached by somebody to act as a mediator, I'm saying to the solicitor, present company obviously accepted because you're here, I know only because of this lecture and not all the other ones. Um, you know, I, I say, what I say to them is, I have a kind of an information pack and I can send this out to you that you can give it to your client to explain what mediation is all about, how it works, etc. And so that they'll be up to speed. Now, half the time I know I'm actually giving it to the lawyer so the lawyer can get up to speed. But that's no bad thing either. But they then uh, would have an obligation to advise the client in relation to this. And you'd be surprised, the people who come around. A couple of years ago in Cork, as part of a group, I organised a seminar on mediation. And we got a guy by the name of Michael O'Brien from Barry Galvin's office to come along to talk about late in life, so to speak, in terms of his professional life, because he'd be of no older than I am, uh, how he had come to mediation and his experience of it. And he gave a fantastic speech in favour of using mediation. And I'll give you the entire speech. He stood up and he said the following. You know, I was very iffy about this mediation, Lark, but you know what? It worked. It got sorted. And the client was happy. And I got a great fee. Thanks. And he sat down. <laughs> and that summed it up. And people who were there, uh, if anyone, Ken would know him, uh, if anyone knows Michael, they, they'd know, Jesus, if it's good enough for Michael O'Brien, it's good enough for me. And it, it was, as I say, one of the best speeches I ever heard in relation to it. And uh, again, one of the number of books that I've written is on professional negligence. You do not want to find yourself being accused of not having done this. And the paper trail is all important. So when you do this, document you've done it. The easiest thing is keep a copy of what you provided the client and the covering letter. Ideally, get them to sign off on an instruction. Yes, I got this, uh, and this feeds into the statute declaration that you're going to have to sign off on in a minute. But get them to sign a written uh, acknowledgement. Yes, I have been given the following information. Yes, I have uh, assimilated this information. No, I'm not going to go mediation. And ideally, put, get them to put down the reasons why. And put down the fact that you advised them that they should do it, and they're not taking your advice. When the... The Oireachtas Committee five years ago was uh, looking at the heads of the bill. I think William was there on the day as well, did the submissions. Were you there that day, William? Yeah, the, you were from the Mediation Institute, I think. And I was there for the arbitrators. Anyway, we were all, actually, there were about six groups there, so much so that Michael Creed, who was one of the deputies, said, Jesus, could you not, a lot of you, could you not mediate between yourselves? But uh, one of the suggestions that the, we as the arbitrators suggested was that a solicitor should be obliged not to do a tick box exercise of a certificate not just a declaration, as they have actually provided for in the final bill, Stroke Act, but that the parties themselves should sign an affidavit as to why they would or would not go to mediation, and that that would have implications in terms of costs that we look at later on. Uh, but they did a compromise, and they, it, the obligation to ensure that everything is done rests on the shoulders of the lawyer. Yet another thing to be sued for. So, all important, uh, make sure that you've got your paper trail. Again, providing the information the advantages. And you've got to think of yourself as a solutions provider. Um, from a business perspective, people want solutions, ideally, as soon as possible and as cheap as possible. They don't necessarily want to be told, well, you're talking about high court proceedings. It'll take about two years unless you go to the commercial court. We'll say two years. It's going to cost you 50 grand minimum to get to the point where senior counsel is standing up and saying, I'll be here on behalf of the plaintiff. Uh, they preferably want it done in short order. And if you can get a reputation as someone who can solve the client's problem in eight weeks rather than eight months or two years, you'll get a repeat business. And I'll give you an example. Uh, nothing to do with mediation. A number of years ago, I got a phone call from uh, the CEO of a shipping company um, who was dealing with one of the large firms in Dublin. And they had asked a question of the insolvency department in that firm who couldn't answer it. They had answered the question of the maritime department in that firm who couldn't answer it. So they googled maritime and shipping lawyer. And I'm involved in the Maritime Law Association as well for about 30 odd years. And my name came up, so they rang me. And basically, they had shipped this very... Uh, tightly packed container of very valuable goods for a company that went into examinership. The examiner wanted the container released in order to get the money 
that would come in on foot of the valuable goods and said to the shipping company, you can't hold it. It's in, the company's in examinership, you can't assert any charges, etc. And I said, no, you're not doing that. A shipper's lien is a passive right. It, it's not seeking to enforce anything, it just sits there. You're entitled, you don't have, don't have to do anything active. So, again, no one's ever said that before, apparently. Uh, so what happened was the uh, solicitors for the examiner went to the High Court, Frank Clark at the time, and said, we need €150,000 to get this container released, that being the core shipping costs of the company that they wanted to cover. And there was a Section 10 certificate given uh, for it. So the client was delighted. They had their core costs covered by getting that in short order. Uh, then the examinership went through, was successful, and uh, the dividend check for the examinership came through. So I rang the client and said, the, the, I have a check here for slightly over 10 grand uh, in relation to the dividend. What's that? And I explained, well, you got the core costs, but actually you're owed more. So this is the balance, the, the, a percentage of the balance that you were due from the examinership. And the CEO said, well, we've ruled it off here. But of course, we haven't got your bill yet. Uh, 10,000, was it that? That's about your bill, wouldn't it be? And I said, that could be my bill. Now, it was three hours work from my point of view. It's the most remunerative three hours I ever did. But the gratitude curve was high and they had no problem with me uh, sending a bill for 10 grand because I provided a solution in short order. Now, if you get a repetition, I'm not suggesting you get 10 grand an hour or three, three grand an hour for fees uh, as a solutions provider in any context, but, and that's never going to happen to me again, I think. Uh, well... I hope they would, but, uh, you know, if you get the reputation as being a solutions provider, you can charge very handsomely and profitably for providing results in short order. You won't be reliant on the big fee once every couple of years from some case. That, in reality, is only cross-subsidising for all the bummers of cases and the no-hopers and the lost leaders and the no-win, uh, no-fee uh, cases that you look at. It. Um, it just makes economic sense. The practices solicitor, again, you are the person who has the responsibility of confirming to the court that this is done. It's no longer a certificate. It's no longer a tick box exercise. You must now swear a statutory declaration. And uh, no doubt you will recall, and it wasn't a, a statutory declaration, it was an affidavit. But if you remember, a newly qualified solicitor had an audience with Peter Kelly uh, earlier in the year as a result of an experience regarding the swearing of affidavits. The courts take this thing very seriously. And if somebody pipes up uh, in the course of a case, oh, but I was never told about the option of mediation, the solicitor never advised me. The, the statute declaration you provide is going to become all important. And if it's your word against the client, who is the court likely to believe? Um, this is where, as I say, if you get the written instructions from your client, yes, you have told me, yes, I've considered it, no, I'm not going there, I know it's against your advice, that's your insurance policy. Uh, the court's role, the court, now, it, I won't bore you with the history, it's a different lecture, but they, in, under the previous rules, it wasn't really an option for the court to take it on itself to suggest to people that they would go to mediation. It used to happen all the time, but there was no real power under the rules to do it. Uh, now there's a power for the court of its own volition and motion to invite the parties to consider mediation or any other ADR procedure with a view to, to doing it. And if the courts and the parties decide that they're going to mediate, they can adjourn it, uh, make an order extending the time for compliance with anything, or any other order as is necessary. Uh, the court's role, again, uh, the party can apply to have it sent uh, to mediation. And I mentioned about the one compulsory element of mediation. Where there's a mediation agreement, in other words, where parties have provided in an agreement that prior to litigation, they will mediate, and someone just ignores that, issues the proceedings, serves them. What you're entitled to do, in the same way as you would do with arbitration, you're entitled to enter the appearance for the purpose of making an application to the court to get an order that they go to mediation. Um, so you must apply immediately after you put in your appearance and say, Judge, mediation agreement provided, can you please order them to go? Now, it's like anything else, it's horses to water. You can force the horse to go to the water, you can't force them to drink. But uh, it, it may bring some kind of a, a sense to the process. The mediators report to court. This was a very controversial one because uh, where does it sit with the confidentiality element? Um, but there is a provision that in court referred mediation, in other words, where it comes from the court and goes to mediation, the mediator must send the court a report uh, in relation to the outcome. And there are certain things that must be stipulated. It must set out why the mediation did or did not take place, if so, where and when, and if it did, whether settlement was reached on everything, on part, or whatever, uh, and setting out the terms. Uh, you can see the cartoon, in my opinion, that the three pigs did their share of huffing and puffing. There's an element of that kind of reporting as well, um, because the, the court has to be informed as to whether one of the parties 
uh, frustrated or, or didn't contribute to it in some way. And that's a very dangerous territory for a mediator to be in because when it comes to considering the costs, there's provisions later that we look at that the court can consider the conduct of the parties in deciding whether or not they get their costs. And if they didn't engage in mediation, which is one of the, or didn't engage properly, which is one of the issues, the only source of information in relation to that is the mediator's report that somebody did or did not engage in relation to it. Um, limitation periods, again, the clock stops uh, once the thing goes to mediation and it ends on a period of 30 days after the mediation settlement is signed, a mediation is terminated and the mediator must inform in writing when it terminates. Again, wearing my professional negligence hat, I would say don't rely on this provision as you get out of jail clause where you've got the clock ticking. Uh, if you've got a statute problem, issue the proceedings by all means like the, two, the four brothers uh, ready to serve the proceedings. Have them in your back pocket ready to serve if it doesn't work out, but you've at least stopped the clock once you wish the proceedings. Don't rely on the get out of jail clause that's in that. Mediation motion, I've already mentioned that you can apply to the court. Uh, and again, the court must make the order during the proceedings. If it's satisfied, there's no reason why uh, it couldn't have gone to mediation um, and the applicant party remains ready, willing and able to, to go to mediation for the implementation. Uh, that's similar to the grounds under the Arbitration Act. Fees and costs, I've already mentioned, split equally. Uh, they must be proportionate. In other words, you can't decide that you're going to uh, build yourself a huge pension fund or the fee you're going to charge in one mediation. It's not going to be like a senior council's brief fee. Um, I was explaining to a Chamber of Commerce breakfast meeting a number of years ago uh, about you know, the legal costs and how the fees stack up in terms of uh, solicitor, junior and senior. And uh, there was a comment from one of the people who was present saying that they couldn't understand why a few weeks after their case they bumped into their senior counsel who couldn't remember them, let alone what the case was about. Uh, and they were very upset considering the amount of money they paid this senior counsel. And I was trying to explain that senior counsel's brains are like um, limited memory space on a computer. You know, they have to download, wipe everything from the brain to absorb all the detail of the, the new case. And I made a Freudian slip. And I said, you know, consequently they become experts at, you know, dumping all the information they have and just absorbing vast amounts of money in a short space of time. Um, and it was only when I got that reaction I realised that I actually said money instead of information. And I corrected it. And the guy said, no, no, you got it right the first time. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, a brief fee can be huge uh, on the basis that it's proportionate to the, the potential case. But equally, fees of a mediation have to be reasonable and proportionate. Now, there's no provision in the Act itself. This is in relation to the fees of the mediator. But what about the fees of the parties going into mediation? Somebody quotes a huge fee akin to a brief fee going into a mediation. Uh, and it mediates and successfully is done by lunchtime. Will the 50 grand, 25 grand fees, and I've seen them for senior counsel in mediation, will they stack up on taxation? Dot, 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 watch this space. The award of costs, when the court is considering awarding costs, a court may, doesn't have to, may have regard to any unreasonable refusal or failure of a party to consider going to mediation, or... Uh, a ref or an unreasonable refusal or failure by a party to attend the mediation. Now, what's attending? Turning up, taking off the watch, putting it down, ticking down the clock, or engaging meaningfully, as in attending uh, in good faith? These slides are lifted from a previous presentation, hence you've got a bit of blue to relieve the white. Uh, but these are just cases, I won't go through them in detail because of the, the time constraints, but these are all cases about where the courts denied a party to proceedings, their costs, either because they went to to litigation in breach of a contractual commitment to try and seek resolution through ADR in the first place, or they unreasonably went to court when the result could have been obtained as a result of a process of mediation. Uh, Ralph de Guerin, no order as to costs. Dunnett and Rail Track is the principal head case in, in the UK. Uh, again, a party penalised for unreasonably refusing to mediate. McCarthy and Sullivan, uh, the court gave a warning in relation to costs implications. Cable and Wireless, again, breach of a mediation clause before going to court, so the costs were denied in that. Uh, successful party in Dunnett and Rail Track was denied their costs on the basis that they could have achieved the result through mediation. Hurst and Leeming, that was a, a partnership case where basically the, the, the refusal to go to mediation was on the basis, he's a looper, I paraphrase, but the judge essentially agreed, yes, the, you would have got nowhere, unreasonable person, you had to come to court. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, Government Department was denied costs because they hadn't lived up to a pledge to pursue ADR methods. Uh, Leicester Circuits, again, successful party denied costs because they pulled out of a mediation uh, without good reason shortly before trial. Media information sessions in family law, again, the Minister can prepare and publish schemes for delivery of all this. The devil is in the detail. The various acts under the Family Law Act, which provided for the tick box exercise of a certificate to go in saying, yeah, yeah, told the client about that huggy wuggy stuff. 
uh, you know, conciliation or marriage guidance, all that rubbish. Been there, done that. Not good enough anymore. They're all now amended to provide that there has to be a statutory declaration uh, rather than a certificate. So it's elevating the responsibility of the solicitor. Again, if you're in that space, uh, make sure that you get the client to sign off on it so they have your paper trail. The lawyer's role... I'm not saying there isn't a role for lawyers in a mediation. There is, and in fact, it's a lot better if they're there, particularly the more complex the issues are, because they can advise the client, this is the size, the shape, the depth, and the length of the hole you're about to jump into. Are you happy that you're going to do that? And they make the informed decision to jump in breaking their neck. Uh, once they, the lawyer has advised them, and it's not the mediator uh, who's going to have the finger pointed at them, that's it. So pre-mediation, they, they advise them. In mediation, they advise them and they draft the mediated agreement. And post-mediation, if there are court rulings involved, if it's a court referred one or whatever, they can uh, refer it that way. When to mediate, no right time, no wrong time. Just take the time to consider whether you should do it. Now, sometimes people say you need discovery first. You don't necessarily need discovery first. If you know what the case is about and you can explain the headlines, the mediator needs the headlines. They don't need the, the full newspaper. Um, but sometimes what happens is the costs become an issue because it's become so entrenched and it's gone on for so long that now the, the issues themselves may be capable of resolution, but the legal costs become a stumbling block in relation to it. Um, not everybody will mediate. Back to Hurston and, and, and Leeming, the partnership case. This is a quote from my mother, uh, whom I get to quote every single day, at least once. There's no point in someone being stupid unless they get a chance to show it. And you must be able to think instantly of at least one client that that applies to. The, the person who says it's the principle of the thing. Uh, now, principle is fine as long as they're willing to pay for it. Um, but I'm very, again, different lecture. I'm fascinated in relation to what makes people tick and what makes people tick. Uh, and sometimes there isn't a lot of a difference between the two. Uh, as I said, the media need the, the headlines, not the full text of war and peace. Um, but don't think it's too late simply because you're on the steps of the, the court uh, to mediate. Uh, examples of, of cases which have been mediated out of court, Pat Kenny and Gerald Charlton solicitor the row over the hedge, uh, if you remember, Dubliners in EMI uh, over various uh, contracts. They were all arose at the court proceedings and within one or two days of being sent out to mediate where cases were called on for weeks and months at a time, uh, things were successfully mediated. Um, don't believe your own hype. Again, you need a, a realistic case evaluation. Uh, you know, look at the strengths and weaknesses of your own case. Ideally, do a critical analysis. Part of the role of a mediator is to do a reality check, be the devil's advocate, communicate the points of the other side, puncture holes and bubbles of expectation. And sometimes it's only in the course of that process that people realise that all is not rosy in their case. And again, back to what makes people tick. The psychology of mediation is different. Uh, litigation is a destructive, negative process in the sense that people approach it from the point of view of, I want... And as far as they're concerned, if they're going to achieve a settlement outside a court, they have to give up something to get to a settlement. Mediation is a different process because as a mediator, what you try and get people to do is, yeah, yeah, you want, I see your, your want list includes not just the apology damages, but uh, three tons of ice cream. Uh, you know, do you really need the ice cream? Just think of what we'll do to your waistline. Eliminate the wants. Focus on the needs. And once you establish what people need, what do you need as an outcome? What can you live with as an outcome? And you work up from there, anything is a bonus. So that's viewed as a positive. And this is part of the psychology. Lots of stuff you can read about it, but that's the voodoo stuff uh, that William practices on a regular basis, and he's very good at it. Um, explain the process very thoroughly, carefully to people, the how, the when, the why. So again, even from a defence point of view, you can't be accused that you didn't do it properly afterwards. You prepare the client. Uh, an apology could be the thing. You might be wrong, dead wrong. Uh, but you can imagine you know, the opening statement, I appear on behalf of the plaintiff in this case. Uh, at the outset, Judge, I'd like to say, my client wishes to apologise unreservedly and profusely for the wrong what he done. End of case. It doesn't happen. Uh, whereas within the confidentiality of mediation, you can start by apologising. And unless and until such time as a mediated settlement agreement, it can't come back to bite you. But it can take the sting out of the thing. Because people, uh, that might be what want, people want to hear. Um, it could be for the way a message was con conveyed. It could be for the heated tone in which somebody was addressed. The vitriolic terms in which they were described. Uh, and again, you know, as a mediator, it's important that you'd understand all the background. I was asked to mediate a case at one stage, top and bottom, apartment row, over transmission of noise. 
And we were in what I call the group hug at the opening session. I'm explaining the rules. You know, we'll all have respect for each other. And you, would you prefer surnames or first names? When one, it was just husband and wife on each side, no representatives. Uh, one, it was at the apartment management company who asked me to mediate, but they didn't give me the full history. One of the guys jumped up, l jumped across the table and knocked the other fellow's eyes out. And they basically didn't like the way he was looking at his wife. Now, if I can describe it, uh, it was recognised in the course of the subsequent mediation discussions that within the social media within which these people uh, would pass their daily lives, that's an appropriate response if someone looks at your wife the wrong way. Um, but once it was clarified that he, he hadn't actually looked, that was accepted, and the two gentlemen uh, met and shook hands uh, so we could get past that issue. And we did actually successfully mediate the, the noise issue, but we had to go through other mediations first. Um, preparing a case statement, again, uh, preparing properly. You wouldn't go into trial without preparing your case properly. Do no less preparation for mediation. Uh, you know, as a mediator, uh, William would love to know what the, the, the whole story is. He, he doesn't necessarily need everything by way of discovery, but he'll need the pleadings as a core thing. He'll need submissions if there were any previously. He'll need to know what the positions of the parties is. And if you have a, a very reasonable case statement made out explaining why your client is being reasonable here, and these are their expectations, these are their wants, but look, these are their needs. This is the zone uh, of comfort within which they're willing to settle. That makes William's job much easier. Um, again, what you set out in it, I'm not going to bore you with all the detail, you can look at the slides afterwards uh, in relation to it. Decide on who's going to make the opening statements in relation to it. Uh, one of the great advantages of mediation uh, is down to the question of uh, being able to address the other side. And that's um, because you get to persuade the other side. Brian McMahon gave a great talk to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators lunch a number of years ago, advocacy, and he says, the thing about advocates is you listen to the counsel for the plaintiff and you think, my God, she's right. And then you listen to the counsel for the defendant and you think, my God, he's right. And he says, it's at that point it's important you listen to the little voice in the back of your head saying, cop on, lad, they can't both be right. Now, that's where you're trying to persuade the judge in a McGregor versus Mayweather standoff. You know, who's the better, who delivers the better punches, who's got the better points, who should get more ticks on the, their side of the, the, the sheet in order to win the case. In mediation, your advocacy should be to try and persuade the other side that you're right and that you're being reasonable and that what you're suggesting by way of compromise is appropriate. And in an opening session, uh, your objective should be not that they go away thinking, didn't we lay it down for them? Didn't we tell them why we were right? It should be that they go back and say, you know, actually, when you think about what they had to say, and you get them thinking about what you have to say. Again, a uh, different lecture for a different day. Um, I'm conscious that we're getting towards the end of the time. It's all, the, all the devil is in the detail on these slides. You can read through them at your own time. Uh, important to hug your lawyer every day. Um, the perspectives, as an arbitrator I always explain, there are different perspectives of what happened. And perspective is very important, and under getting an understanding of what people's perspective is and how people see things. Uh, and as an arbitrator I say to people, when you've got two sides, there are four versions of what happened. There's what one side says happened, the other side, what may have happened, or what I ultimately as a, an arbitrator decide. But as a mediator you try and get each side to recognise the perspective of the other side. Um, that's it. 57 minutes, we have two minutes for questions. Going once. Can I ask a question about the report that the media will have to send back into court? Yeah. This didn't work because. Is there any scope for the parties to see it happen? Yes. I know obviously the mediator had an independent staff, but in terms of the mediator receiving a draft, uh, commenting on it before. It yeah, it's, in the, it's in, actually in the act. They must send it a week before it goes to the court. There's an expression that water finds its own level. Uh, 
and you know you, you get somebody who's being totally unrealistic totally unreasonable and then they will try and find a council if they're using council uh, who will operate in the same way everybody i think will resonate with that experience and ultimately the only person who can if you want to put that expression to it put manners on them if they recognize what's happening would be a judge however in mediation again uh, a good mediator should be in a position to, to control that and, as I say, burst the bubbles of expectation. But the important issue is that the mediator is engaging with the parties, not with the representatives. In negotiations, the parties don't get to talk to each other. In mediation, it should be the parties talking to each other or talking through the mediator. And to a certain extent, uh, when, as a mediator, you're talking to the parties, you need to, to burst a couple of bubbles with the lawyers. Now, sometimes they won't let you do that. Uh, I had a professional negligence case where I was acting for a firm of accountants on the instructions of their insurance company where essentially the defence was you sued the wrong people. You should have sued the solicitors involved in the property transaction, not the accountants. And we agreed to mediation in writing with certain ground rules, including that there was going to be a joint opening meeting with opening statements. And we were, that was going to be what was going to happen. We were going to tell the client on the other side, the plaintiff, you did have a case but you should have sued the solicitors and here's why and here's where the liability was but you sued the accountants the wrong people uh, when we got to the mediation they refused to have the opening meeting they said no no we're here to just discuss how much you're going to pay us and i said no we had very clear ground rules on this we were going to have this opening meeting either we have the opening meeting or we don't proceed with the mediation over in 30 minutes and said you can explain to you can give a story if you want to the, to the client as to why it wasn't going to happen but we have the agreement in writing and if and when it comes to court, uh, and the question is asked about mediation, we will explain there were agreed ground rules and you frustrated the ground rules. So take your pick. Now they came back subsequently uh, with a walk away because they understood that actually they weren't going to be able to bring the, uh, the case home. But sometimes you have to stand up. Sorry, I deviated. Any? So I think we, we might leave it there. Okay, yep. Thanks very much.